So good morning, everyone. Uh, today we conclude our um, series on the book of Haggai. My daughter Eden is slow. I know that sounds negative. It feels almost like a betrayal to write it. Our world really welcomes slowness. But Eden, who is nine years old and has Down syndrome, remains unaware of the need to rush, ever. This morning she walked out of the house with mismatched mittens, me pushing from behind and her dad ushering her forward, one bus driver and 40 kids waiting for her to cross the street. With hat askew and her backpack slipping off her shoulder, she stopped in the driveway, took a deep breath and said, Isn't that a beautiful out today? It's really not too bad. Charming now, infuriating then. I do love the idea of slow food, slow reading, slow and thoughtful living, but not on a Monday morning. Because on Monday or any school day, I don't want my children to live slowly. I want them to get up, get dressed, catch the bus. So I don't need to wait in the jumble of cars outside this school, then stand in the parent line of shame to receive tardy slips. One morning a few weeks ago, we were close to being on time for the bus without even having to wait for the driver to wait. Then Eden noticed a piece of paper on the ground and decided she should throw it away. Just seconds from stepping out the door, she turned towards the waste basket while talking to the piece of paper in her hand. We'll just have to go over here, okay? I'm going to put you in there, in here, before I go to school. Then she showed her imaginary friends how to throw something away, in great detail. I felt my body tense as I waited to see her hand let go of the paper. I called her, but her imaginary friends spoke more loudly, and I was torn as always, between wanting to cherish who Eden is and wanting to help her work within daily realities. Eden's exquisite slowness flows beyond getting places on time. Her classmates waited for, for her to join them in line and she put, as she puts on her coat. We often say, let Eden finish what she's saying to her talkative younger sister who wants to interrupt. Even pain takes a few extra seconds to register in Eden's brain. Progress, too, takes a different shape in Eden's life. It took her four years to learn the names of coins. Then one summer, the knowledge slipped away. A wisp of facts floating from her mind. We started again, slowly. Sometimes I wonder how our expectations for Eden would change if our culture's mindset were different. What if saying something was slow was the greatest compliment? And the opposite was considered a weakness. He's still learning right now. He's very fast. Maybe kids like Eden, the slow ones, contribute to a quiet revolution against our busyness. Maybe they're on a secret mission to reverse our priorities. After all, if you only know that Eden is slow, you might not realize how smart she is. You might not guess that she is often the first one in the room to understand a joke or make one. You might not appreciate that she can remember events that happened three years ago and what, we sh what she was wearing and how she felt at the time. Slowness is not something Eden will ever grow out of. Monday mornings aside, I'm not sure I want her to, because even as I try to prepare her for life in a high-speed world, I want to be aware of how I can leave behind my own need to hurry, how I can grow up to be more like my daughter. Often after the rest of us are done with dinner, Eden sits alone at the kitchen table finishing her meal. One bite of yogurt, a pause to rest, another bite, long periods of sitting. 
thinking. I fuss with the dishes to keep her company. She tells me, Mummy, come be with me. I know what she means, but I want to get the dishwasher loaded. I'm right here, sweetie. Eden points, Eden exasperated, points to the stool next to her. No, Mummy, come be with me here. Don't do anything. So I sit, look at her gentle hands, her perfect eyebrows. We smile each, at each other. We talk about yoga. We are slow together. When dinner is finally done for another night, or when we're finally in the car or at the appointment, I pause and wonder how I can live out my daughter's kind of slowness. Not to be late, or lazy, or unkind, but to notice. To be really, really interested in the chalky scrub of the moon still in the sky this afternoon. To be aware that fresh snow on our trees is as beautiful in April as it is in October to see her. Instead, I start the car rolling down the driveway while still putting my, on my seatbelt in the hope that I'll get to the corner light before it turns red. I feel victorious if writing an article or cleaning the kitchen takes less time than I expected. I feel like a failure if it doesn't. When friends text that she's running five minutes late, I think of six things I can do while I wait for her. Unlike my contented, time-free daughter, I am conscious of every hour what I can fit into it and what that means for what I will do next. And even though I want Eden to get into the car on time, to remember what day it is, to be academically ambitious, I hate to see that part of myself in her when it appears. When her eyes widen with anxiety as the bell rings and she's not yet in the school doors, I want to swoop her up, take her home, read to her for the rest of the day. When she asks, are we late again on the way to the doctor, I want to tell her that whatever time we get there will be the right time. Speed and drivenness are so far from who she is that when she tries them on, they fit awkwardly. I begin to realise they fit awkwardly on me too, perhaps on each of us. So I try to receive slow times during the day, the extra minute snuggling my kindergartner when she's warm and soft from bed in the morning, the opportunity to smile at the woman in the checkout line even though she can't find her coupons and the line next to me would have been faster. The quiet walk with the other church members up the aisle for the Eucharist, the pause of eye contact with the chalice bearer before sipping, slow, on slow. When I tell Eden we need to go and she nods and does a few more dance moves around the living room, she is telling me again that she disagrees with me on what is the most important in that moment. Sometimes I realise she's right. She's aware of time, just <coughs> not aware of my kind of time. Perhaps Eden has simply never lost the slowness of heaven. A heaven that brought the Messiah a few hundred years late. Slow to answer Israel's longing. A heaven that allowed Jesus to linger. Slow to visit the dying Lazarus. A heaven that is home to a mysterious God. Slow to give the answers I want for my little girl with the extra chromosome. Tonight before bed, I tell Eden what a joy she is to us. She reaches up to play with my hair and says, Oh, Mummy, you just make my heart more prettier. I look in her eyes and wonder, Can I love slowness when it's something I must do, not something I choose to do? Can I welcome the in-between times and dance through them on the days of only questions can Eden's poetry of slowness seep into my waiting? I kiss her head, adjust her oxygen cannula and pull her bed spread up under her chin. She sighs, don't you just love this world, mummy? This is a common declaration from her recently. 
I always say, it is a good world, isn't it, sweetie? But I stumble on the word, words because sometimes the hardness of this good world leaves little room to notice anything else. But Eden is so certain of joy, so immersed in the goodness, that I agree with her every time. Sweet dreams, we tell each other. She grins. I slip out the door. My daughter Eden is slow, and every day she makes our hearts more prettier. On December the 18th of the second year of King Darius's reign, the Lord sent this message to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Ask the priest this question about the law. If one of you is carrying some meat from a holy sacrifice in his robes, and his robes happen to brush against some bread or stew, wine or olive oil, or any other kind of food, will it also become holy? The priests reply, no. Then Haggai asks, if someone becomes ceremonially unclean by touching a dead person and then touches any of these foods, will the food be defiled? And the priests answer, yes. So what does this remind you of? Is there something that this reminds you of? You see, in the Old Testament, holiness was something that you had to have and that you could lose. But in the New Testament, it all changed with Jesus, didn't it? Jesus was holy, and his holiness, he passed on to those who touched him. The woman who touched Jesus' garment in Mark, we talked about it the first time. She did not have any expectations, but she did have an expectancy. Remember? Remember the difference? You see, she thought he may be able to heal me, but he may not heal me. But it's worth the risk. It's worth going up and touching his garment. And there were hundreds of people who touched Jesus. It was a crowded place. But Jesus was only interested in her because when she touched him, what happened? Power flowed from him to her and she was healed. So why? Why did the power flow from him to her and not to all the others who touched his garment as they walked by? Well, they didn't have any ex expectancy. They weren't. They didn't care if they knocked into Jesus or not, but she did. She was purposely going to touch her, the hem of his garment because she was hoping, above all hopes, that he could heal, heal her. Jesus was able to pass his holiness on to her. She did not make him unclean. He made her clean. And that was a radical change. Then Haggai responded, That is how it is with this people and this nation, says the Lord. Everything they do and everything they offer is defiled by their sin. Look at what is happening to you. Before you begin to lay the foundation of the Lord's temple, when you hoped for a 20 bushel crop, you harvested only 10. When you expected, is that word, when you expected to draw 50 gallons from the wine press, you only found 20. I sent blight and mildew and hail to destroy everything you worked so hard to produce. Even so, you refuse to turn to me, says the Lord. We said expectancy. We need to live beyond our expectations of what God should do or should not do and live life with expectancy of what God wants to do for us and through us. And there's through my tears at the last one. This is a struggle I'm really having at the moment because I have expectations of what I think God should or should not do, but I often lack expectancy. Expectancy, Mark Buchanan said, is a renewal of hope and anticipation. It is a spark in the soul that makes you dare to believe that good can come from bad. Yeah. 
pretty hard in this world in this day with all that's going on, isn't it, to have an expectancy. And when bad things happen to you, what do you think? When the bad things happen to Israel, they forgot what they were meant to do, which is to build the temple. And they said, well, it's all going bad, it's all turning to custard, so, you know, it's not the time to start building a temple now. <laughs> so they didn't. You see, what God wants is you. Before he wants your sacrifices, he wants your attention. Before it's about you giving him something or you getting something for him, from him, it's about seeking his face with your face. That's why Eden's, in a sense, life is prophetic, because she is slow. But in her slowness, she pays attention to what's going on around her, to the world. And what do we do? Well, I don't know about you, but in my hurry, in my hurrying, I often miss what God is saying, what God wants to do. Think about this 18th day of December, the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Think carefully. I am giving you a promise now. While the seed is still in the barn, you have not yet harvested your grain and your grapevine. Fig trees, pomegranates, and olive trees have not yet produced their club, crops. But from this day onward, I will bless you. So, the Lord says, I promise you, now, now you've started building the temple again, I'm going to bless you. And here's where we come to the space in between. So Linda got me thinking about this. We were praying for somebody and she simply said, you know, sometimes the, the in-between times are the most important. So we have where we, where we start or where we started, then the places between and finally, our destination. And often the in-between places, or some would say the journey, are more important than where we started and where we will finish. And we have lots of biblical examples, don't we? We have the fulfilment of God's promise to Abraham. For so long he had a promise, but he didn't have any children. Joseph became the king's assistant. And where did he end up? In prison. David becoming king. He was to take over from Saul. But took a long time. Many years. And you can ask in each of these situations, why did they have to wait so long? Well, if you think of someone like King David, would he have ever had the relationship he had with Jonathan if he'd suddenly become king? Probably not. Would Abraham have been in the hall of faith if things had happened as quickly, you know, the promise had been filled immediately? Possibly not. And would Joseph have been the best king's assistant if he'd got the job straight away? No, going to prison was really important. So the in-between spaces, these are places, oh, I put a Nehemiah near near building the wall is another. So where is your in-between place currently? Where are you at? What are you waiting for? What have you started but haven't yet reached the destination? Are you in a hurry to get there? You see, the in-between spaces are places of much learning. It's where we learn an awful lot. Sometimes it's not in reaching the destination. It's not even in beginning. It's through the journey that we learn. It's the in-between spaces that require us to be faithful, often against our better judgment. It's where we are humbled. It's where we realise our dependency on God. 
where we realise the importance of our brothers and sisters. It's where we realise God and His Word can be trusted. But they're difficult places, the in-between places, because I don't know about you, but I sure want to get to the destination. You see, the faith and the hope, the faith is hard, yeah. and once you get there, the hope is like, yes, we made it, we got here. And then you begin the journey again, another journey. So the question is, are you open-hearted? Are you less attached to the de destination? More willing, less willf willful? <coughs> are you being humbled, not so certain that you know what you need or even want, more ready to ask for help? You see, the in-between spaces are often the places where we cry out to God. Because we don't, things aren't going as planned. Or the things are taking longer than we think they should. Are you trusting, looking for the unexpected opportunities embedded in every failure or plan gone awry? It's difficult when things don't go to plan. It's difficult in the suffering and the pain to say, Okay, God, I might want more right. <laughs> take your time. Mm. No, don't take your time. It's too tough here. Yeah. Are you committed to the destination or committed to the journey itself? You can think of lots of examples. I'm sure. When you're diagnosed with cancer, and then you have a long journey that goes on for month after month after month. I can tell you, your cry is not, uh, I'm, it's okay Lord, take as long as you need to. No, 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 no. <laughs> Get this over and done quickly. But as we, as we said before, sometimes this is where you need to be to learn. And as our, our, so many of those biblical examples where they wouldn't be the people they were unless they waited. And so when in Haggai there God makes the promise and they the seed is still in their barn and the pomegranates and that haven't fruited, what they're waiting. They're waiting for a fulfillment. Is it gonna happen? Are they waiting with ex expectancy that God will do what the, he says they will do? Or are they frustrated? Are they in a hurry? Can I welcome the in-between times and dance through them on the days of only questions? Can Eden's poetry of slowness seep into my waiting? It's obvious in-between times can involve a lot of waiting. Things can move slowly. Am I ready? To slow down? Am I happy to wait patiently for God's timing? Or am I in a hurry to get to the destination? On that same day, the Lord sent the second message to Haggai. Tell Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, that I'm about to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow royal thrones, destroy the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overturn their chariots and riders. The horses will fall and their riders will kill each other. But when this happens, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will honour you. So rather, all son of Shealtiel, my servant, I will make you like a signet ring on my finger, says the Lord, for I have chosen you. I... The Lord of Heaven's armies has spoken. This is the promise for Zerubbabel. I will make you like a signet ring on my finger, says the Lord, for I have chosen you. The signet ring was engraved with the king's seal. It was used to endorse all official documents and was so precious that to guard it against theft, it was worn on the king's person. So remember... I will make you, that's you, you and me, 
like a signet ring on my finger, says the Lord, for I have chosen you. You too will be kept safe until you have fulfilled your God-appointed destiny. So says the Lord of heaven's armies, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of all powers unseen and seen in the universe and in the heaven. That's a pretty amazing promise. Do not ignore the in-between spaces, the in-between places. They bring the chance to make the heart more prettier. When you are less attached to your agenda, your destination, and your timetable, you're more available to respond to God and the genuine needs of those around you. Lord, we thank you that like Zerubbabel, our names are on the palms of your hands, written on the palms of your hand. That you, Lord, have promised that you will be with us, that you will look after us, that you will guide and protect us. That doesn't mean that things will necessarily be easy, but it does mean that you are present here with us. Lord, in the midst of all that's going on, that in the midst of all the difficult things we face, help us to slow down, to be aware of your presence with us, to take time, to spend time with you, Lord, and to notice those around us and what they're going through too. Help us, Lord, when we're struggling to put our trust completely in you.